Welcome. Welcome, everybody. I'm so grateful to have you here with us today. <laughs> I know you're all joining us from all over the world, so feel free to attach where you are in the world to your name like I have here. I would love to be able to see where you're joining us from. While we get into it and settle in, I'd love to just let everybody know some, some basic information to get us all settled into the same space. So for those of you who may not know, my name is Sahar, and I am a Global Citizen Year Ecuador alum from 2017. And I studied cultural studies in Canada and have full circle come back to work for Global Citizen Year now. Um, and I would love to just give a brief introduction for those of you who may not know. Um, an introduction to Global Citizen Year and a few housekeeping things before we dive into the real meat of the, <laughs> of the situation here. And so um, Global Citizen Year is an organization launching a generation of leaders with the perspective, skills, and networks to solve humanity's most urgent challenges. Using the formative transition into adulthood, we help talented, diverse young people shape their values, identity, and purpose in ways that classroom learning alone cannot. Through our virtual academy and immersive fellowship, we combine curriculum, coaching, and lived experience to help our students develop the real power skills of the 21st century, resilience, empathy, agency, and leadership in order to build a more just, equitable, and sustainable world. And so while we're all joining in here, I just have a few housekeeping items and then we'll dive into some introductions. For those of you who are joining, as I mentioned, you can feel free to put your location in your display name as I have here. Please turn your camera on if you can. We strongly encourage you to. We'd love to see who's in the room. And if you have any questions, there is a Slido link in the chat. And so in this link, you could submit a question and we'll be able to see it on our end to approve it. In terms of reactions, this is a virtual world. So it's a little bit challenging sometimes to show how much appreciation and love we may have for the people in the room. So I'd love for us to just um, practice using the emojis. If you haven't used the emojis before, totally fine. This is a great time to try it. And so if you are a student from our recent spring 2022 cohort, I want you to give me a clap emoji. And so I'm gonna show you what that one looks like. It's like a little pop. Anybody in here? Am I seeing any students? Samantha, I see you, how exciting. And if you're an alum like myself, show us the tada emoji. And so that's a little celebration. Let's see if we got any alums in here. How exciting. And finally, if you're part of the larger Global Citizen Year community or you're interested in joining us, then please give us a heart emoji. Love to see your hearts. Oh, so nice. <laughs> Hi, Wendy, Doug, everybody in here. Also, oh, so nice to have you joining us. So just for some logistics, the speaker will be joining us for one hour. Throughout that time, um, there are gonna be questions also coming in from the audience members. And so if your question is selected, we'll call on you to ask your question directly. So the way to do that will be to turn on your video and we'll be able to spotlight you. And in terms of just some Zoom etiquette, please try to stick to many of the questions that you know, have been um, approved in the Slido. And we may not have enough time to get to all of the questions, but I really hope that we will. And so if we don't, just know that your question is still awesome and you're awesome. <laughs> and we really try our best to get to as many as possible. And at the end, if you wanted to share some gratitude with the speaker, you can definitely do that with the survey that we'll place in there at the end. And so before we really get started, I don't know if Valerie wanted to start off with the land acknowledgement and then I'll introduce you. I'm so excited to spend this hour with you all. And I just know I need a deep breath with everything that's happening in the world. So. I invite us to take that deep breath together. Let's begin by just feeling your feet on the earth. And you can close your eyes and lower your eyes for a moment and just notice the difference between holding your body up and letting the earth hold you up. Good, my love, you have arrived, you are here. Nothing to do except be here with an open heart, open eyes, open ears. I invite you to imagine these roots pushing down from the bottom of your feet, helping you sit a little taller, the straight dignity of your spine and those roots now are going vertically. And then 
horizontally reaching out for the roots of everyone else who is here. Ah, intertwining with Sahara's roots in Panama. And then reaching out to mine in LA. Good, and then Wendy in the Bay Area. Good, Leticia and Abby and Theo and Doug and Nidhi and all of the people who are here imagining all around the world, those roots spreading out. We are like trees in the forest. We look as though we are standing apart, but we are interconnected. We are interdependent and we can send each other energy and nourishment when we need it. So in this moment, feeling those roots beneath us. I invite you now to imagine the ancestors who walked on this land before, before you. And if you know the name of those indigenous ancestors, let that name come to your lips, the Tongva people. Acknowledging their connection to us, their resilience and wisdom past, present and future. Good, and now I invite you to bring to your mind's eye an ancestor who makes you brave. It could be someone from your family line. And if that's not available to you, it could be someone from recent history for all of humanity's our kin. So choose one person. When you think of them, you feel a little courage in your heart. Good, and just enjoy that. Right now, imagining all of our ancestors gathered here around us, imagining us transforming this virtual space into a sacred space. Let us sink into this feeling of connection and courage in this hour together. Good, and now with the roots beneath us, the earth under us, the ancestors behind us, I invite you to take a deep breath into all the parts of your body that need it. Are you ready? Let it come mm, and let it go. And just one more, <laughs> let it come. Mm, there it is and let it go. Beautiful, you can flutter your eyes open. You can stretch for a moment. Thank you so much for going deep with me. That felt really good to me. I hope, I hope you enjoyed it too. Thank you so much. That was so beautiful. And I think for those of you who um, have not been introduced to Valerie before, that was a great, <laughs> that was a great way to just see the power behind this human being on the screen with us today. <laughs> and so um, I'd like to just give a brief introduction to you, Valerie. Um, so Valerie Poor is a renowned civil rights leader, lawyer, award-winning filmmaker, educator, innovator, and best-selling author of See No Strangers. She leads the Revolutionary Love Project to reclaim love as a force for justice. Valerie has won policy change on multiple fronts from hate crimes to racial profiling, immigration detention, solitary confinement, internet freedom, and so much more. She founded Ground Zone Movement, Faithful Internet, and the Yale Visual Law Project to inspire and equip advocates at the intersection of spirituality, storytelling, and justice. Valerie has been a regular TV commentator on MSNBC and contributed to CNN, NPR, PBS, The Hill, Huffington Post, and The Washington Post. Valerie has earned degrees at Stanford University, Harvard Divinity School, and Yale Law School. And so there's this amazing introduction, um, coupled with the spirit you, that you just <laughs> shared with us on screen. And I'd love for you to just kind of um, take a moment to kind of expand that introduction. I know sometimes when we do these introductions, we tend to go for the um, most flashy professional things on the bio, but I know that you are so much more than that. So feel free to expand that bio for us. Oh, I'm a mama. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a mama to small children. My babies are three and seven. I'm still nursing my younger one to sort of give her vaccine protection through the milk. So the labor is a lot. <laughs> That's the invisible labor, right? It's like from the moment one wakes up at six in the morning to the moment the nine, you know, the other one goes to sleep at nine at night. And then every moment it's it's laboring for them or laboring for the movement or laboring for the organization it's sort of it's sort of nonstop, and so much of it is invisible 
And I think that's the case for so many of us who are caregiving, who are taking care of our families, our friends, our babies, each other during this wild time that is so, so difficult. It's so difficult to be well. I've actually let go of the idea of self-care. I don't think it's a very useful term. <laughs> I like, if you're breathless, if you're facing the abyss, like the yoga mat and the latte, is not gonna do it. I mean, I like both of those things, but you know, what if we shifted from self-care to community care? Like how do we build communities where we are caring for each other, where everyone's needs are met? And that is what we try to model in our home. On Sunday evenings, we have a, a discussion about our family meeting around our needs <laughs> this week. And, and we show up to try to try, try to give each other what we need. So I, as hard as the labor is, I feel very fortunate to live in a multi-generational home. My parents live with us and, and then so three generations in this house. And it's a lot of, it's a lot of noise and it's, and it's a lot of love. So that's the, that's the more complete picture behind that line. <laughs> I love that. Oh, that's so, I love that Sunday kind of community care moment where you also listen to the kids, you know, I think sometimes we forget that children are part of the community. <laughs> Usually they're like under the table with their like, yeah, but you're right. Soon we'll draw them out. <laughs> and I, I'd love to um, think back to the people who labored for you, right? You're talking about, you know, parents, grandparents, ancestors. Um, so could you take us back to your childhood? you know, growing up in California. Um, uh, you mentioned that your family settled uh, there as Indian Punjabi farmers a century ago. And a lot of your orientation to the world was through stories and scriptures and songs that your grandparents shared with you uh, from the Sikh faith. And so I'd love if you could paint a picture for us of how your, your history, your family, your faith have all kind of planted the seeds of who you are today. Yeah, well, you know, the ancestor in the opening, the ancestor I called to my back uh, mm -hmm. was my grandfather. He was a gorgeous human being, just tall, dignified man, wore a turban and beard as part of his faith. And he, he helped raise me. He lived with us when I was a child. And I grew up on the farmlands of California, like out in the country, the horses next door, the cows across the street. Um, at night, it was dark enough to see the stars, to the Milky Way every night. I mean, it was really... I came, you know, my family had lived and farmed on that piece of land for since my other grandfather arrived in 1913. So just such a deep connection to the soil, to the land, to the place. And my 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 mother's father, Papaji, my grandfather, he's the one who just poured in my ear all of the scriptures, that was that was his favorite Shabbat. It was the hot winds cannot touch you. You are shielded by love. So I felt so protected. I felt so powerful with all the stories that he would give me. And in, in the Sikh faith, um, it's it's the heart of the Sikh faith is Ik Om God, the, the divine oneness that you can look upon the face of anyone and say, you are a part of me. I do not yet know. And if you are a part of me, I do not yet know. If you are my sister, you are my brother, you are my sibling, then I must stand up for you when you are in harm's way. So Papaji would always say, love, <laughs> love is dangerous business. You can't eat business. You can't say, I love you. I love you. I love you. It's all talk, no action. Love is what we do. Like I have, you know, so my grandfather was a warrior and I come from a, a lineage of warriors, farmers, warriors, poets, who really held this model of the Santh Sapahi, the sage warrior, the, the sage loves the warrior fights, the warrior fights, the sage loves. It's a path of revolutionary love that I think was planted in me as a child. Um, it wasn't, of course, until I started to go to school, <laughs> public school, that I realized that the rest of the world didn't see me the way that I saw myself. Um, my first racial slur was at six years old. Um, it was on the schoolyard. It was get up, you black dog. And I remember thinking, but I'm brown, not black. <laughs> and then I realized it didn't make a difference that blackness and brownness were inferior in this um, culture of white supremacy that I didn't have language for. So that was the beginning of a series of struggles through my childhood of trying to understand myself in a, a wider, mostly white conservative culture that saw me as a brown child and as a sick child, um, as, as a non-Christian, as someone who was gonna go to hell. So I, I lost best friends who tried to convert me to Christianity. I lost my, my, my 
my favorite teacher sat me down after school and told me that it was my job to save my whole family. I had a neighbor come and perform an exorcism on me, telling me that every time I was saying that there were many paths to, to the divine, it was the devil speaking to me. It was just this series of crises. And I remember like, I think I could have caved in. I could have just said the words to make it okay. Like I accept Christ as my Lord and savior, except I saw my grandfather and I knew that he was good and he was beloved and he had the divine beating in his heart. And so I stood strong because I knew there was no way my grandfather would go to such a place as hell. And so that was the beginning of me finding language around religious pluralism. And really I, I, I'm grateful for those encounters because I, it set me on the path where I began to study religion and divinity and then eventually law all coming out of that place of like, how do people with different backgrounds, races, places, faiths find common community together? And because I, I, I saw the rupture of it as a kid is I, I was so interested in devoting the rest of my life to the repair of it. Love that. And I'm actually curious to know if you remember, you know, after the first time that someone ever said a racial slur to you, do you remember what you know, your grandfather said, or uh, did you, did you come home to talk about it or? You know, I, I didn't feel angry. I felt, I felt ashamed. Mm. Like, like the little boy was just holding up a mirror to me at a different angle. And I just had never seen myself through that mirror before. I was like, oh, that's who I am to you. And then I felt ashamed. And I, I think they call it internalized oppression, but I think that was the beginning of this voice in my head that was like, you're not, you're not strong enough. You're not smart enough. You're not human enough. You're not American enough. You're not white enough. You're not beautiful enough that like you're that not enoughness. I, I think, I think took root in those early years and because it, it was how the boy saw me. And then it's begin, it begins to be how you see yourself. Right. And I, I call that voice the little critic. And I was lucky because when I went home, I had a grandfather who told me stories of, of like, our ancestors were warriors. <laughs> like, you know, you have to refuse to hate them even if they hate you. Like, that's what it means to be a revolutionary for love. And so he projected into me this voice, I think that I, I think of as the wise woman who says, oh, my love, you are enough. You are brave enough. And honestly, Sahar, my entire life since then, all the decades, has been this like beautiful struggle to listen to the wise woman every time the little critic wants me to get small, <laughs> get quiet, get small, don't say the thing, don't put that out, don't tell the story, don't make that leap. Like the little critic, I think in all of us will wanna make us small. And so my constant practice is to listen to the wise woman in me and says, oh my love, take a breath. All right, the solution is not silence, it's more solidarity. So who can you go do that thing and who can have, who can be at your back? <laughs> who can be at your side? Do it, just don't do it alone. And so now it's like the wise woman, listening to the wise woman in me over and over again. I actually have a journal that I call the wise woman journal. She says, wise woman here, wise woman says, oh, my love. <laughs> she's, she's very sweet. She calls me my love. She's like, oh, my love. <laughs> take, you know, take a deep breath. You're tired. Pour the tea. You're going to be with the students. You're going to be with these young leaders. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to be yourself. I mean, she talks to me all the time <laughs> and listening to that wise woman in me is finally how I began to learn how to love myself. Wow. I love that. It makes me, it makes me feel like everyone should have that wise person within them. <laughs> Yeah, but it takes a lot. It takes a lot, I think, to find the silence within yourself that allows for that wise person to speak as well. Um, I'm curious to know. It does. Okay. May, may I add something? Yes, because please. the thing about the, the wise woman voice is, is that her voice is really quiet. Like the world is so noisy. The voices out there in the world, the voices in my own head, are, it's just so noisy. So I'm going to read this. This is from See No Stranger. And I talk about her at the very end. <laughs> so this is from page 281. Um, so this is to all of you as leaders. I believe that deep wisdom resides within each of us. <clears throat> Some call this voice by different sacred names, spirit, God, Jesus, Allah, Om, Buddha, nature, Vaheguru. Others think of this voice as the intuition one hears when in a calm state of mind. Whatever name we choose, listening to our deepest wisdom requires disciplined practice. 
The loudest voices in the world right now are running on the energy of fear, criticism, and cruelty. The voices we spend the most time listening to in the world, inside our own minds, I'll add on our social media feeds, <laughs> shape the way we see, how we feel, and what we do. When I spend time listening to people who are speaking from their deepest wisdom, I can feel understanding, inspiration, and energy nourish the root of my own wisdom but I must not lose myself at the feet of others. My most vigilant spiritual practice is finding the seconds of solitude to get quiet enough to hear the wise woman in me. I love that. And I think it's the, it's the solitude that can be really transformative. And I feel like the pandemic kind of gave a lot of us you know, not everyone, but I think a lot of us time that we never had before <laughs> to be like, wow, I'm, I'm sitting here in silence. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that's something that's really, really powerful. And I, and I would, I think I would encourage anyone to try to, you know, figure out what that wise person is saying. And for those of you who, who may have seen it, they, they dropped the link to the book in the chat as well. So be sure to check that out. Um, thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm I'm curious to know for you. I I'm I'm not sure if the wise woman was always there, but I I'd love to know at the time when you were graduating from high school, and kind of um, thinking about next steps. You know, what was what was going through your mind at that time? That transition moment. Yeah, it was a lot of like it was excitement and awe and fear. <laughs> You know, I, I grew up growing up with the farmlands, big public high school, just wanting to get out, wanting to get out. And I'm the only kid in my big high school that um, got into an Ivy League like college. Like I got into Stanford and my parents were sh like amazed. <laughs> Everyone was shocked they, and no one knew what was going to happen. Like it was like I was they're sending me to a different planet. It was so far away, it was so foreign. And so I was excited, but I was also really, um, I had a lot of anxiety, like how, how do I make a way in, in this world? And by the time I got there, I was the only sick American student I know who wasn't pre-med because <laughs> my parents just wanted me to study what I loved. And so out of this existential crisis because of my childhood experiences, I studied religion, <laughs> I studied religion. And I was really interested in the partition of India and creating an archive of oral histories from my grandparents' generation. How did they survive a moment when religious difference erupted into mass violence? And I was supposed to travel to India in order to begin my project just a few weeks after the attacks on September 11th. So in the wake of the horror of those attacks, we saw hate violence erupt on city streets against people of color and barely reported in the evening news. And the first person killed in, in an act of hate after 9-11 was a Sikh American father, Balbir Singh Sodhi, who wore a turban just like my grandfather. And for Sikhs, we wear articles of faith, long hair, which men often keep in a turban as a sign that we will, we cannot hide. If you need food, we will feed you. If you need shelter, you can call on us. Like it's supposed to be a sign of our commitment to revolutionary love. And yet how ironic that it's the very thing that marked us for, for bloodshed after 9-11 and since then, the last 20 years. So when Bobir uncle was killed, he was someone my family knew. I went into a, I went into a crisis. I, I didn't know what to do. I, I actually retreated into my bedroom for three days. I didn't come out and I, I wanted to escape. I, I had all these amazing books on my shelf, but you know what I pulled down? I, um, I pulled down Harry Potter. <laughs> I wanted to be in a different world, a different world entirely. And I didn't like my, my people were under attack. The country was under attack. And I just wanted like the, the escape pod. And and then after like reading, like I had like devoured all the books that there were out at that point. And, and um, I realized like, okay, in, this, in these books, like the kids wielded a kind of magic that the adults in their lives wouldn't or couldn't. Mm -hmm. and so I had like an old beat up camera on my, on my bed and I had a list of questions and I asked the university if I could start capturing the stories that 
the country wasn't hearing, starting with Bill Bierenkel's story. And they, I don't think they understood how, how dangerous it was for a young brown kid to get in the car with her turbaned cousin and drive across the country after 9-11. But I'm grateful for their ignorance because that decision really shaped the rest of my life. I, I went from home to home, from city to city, sometimes when the blood was still fresh on the ground. There were no investigative journalists, no mayors, no public attention, just this two kids <laughs> with a camera starting to capture what the country needed to, to know. And that eventually became my first documentary film, Divided We Fall. And since then, um, my my work as, as an activist, I never thought I would I'd be an activist, but everything unfolded from that that first decision because it was a matter of, of life and death for my community. I that's really powerful. Thank you for sharing, first of all. And and I think you just talking about magic makes me think about how, you know, when when we want to fight for something, you know, or fight in the name of something, we it doesn't matter what we have, we'll just we'll pick it up and go, right? Like you're saying with your camera. But I have to say, I mean, the little critic was loud. It was like, all right, <laughs> you don't, all you have is a high school degree. <laughs> You've never made a film before. You barely know how to manage a camera. Like you're, you're third generation. And so many of the families I went to were immigrant families. Like, why would they trust you? Your Punjabi is broken. You know, <laughs> like, the little critic had all these like list of reasons for me just to get quiet, get small, go back to school, keep your head down, right? And, and like, I, I, there was the wise woman in me who like, I had my grandfather, I had Harry Potter on one and my grandfather on the other shoulder who's like, my love, you are a warrior. Like, what does it mean to cultivate inside of ourselves an inner posture where every time we, we feel like we wanna retreat or desert, there's, we listen to that part of ourselves. It's like, you don't have to have all those things. You just have to be brave. Just like Harry was <laughs> like, you just have to be brave. Take that oh, step. <laughs> Love that. Oh my gosh, I can imagine the wise woman being um, really trying to crawl up there beyond the critic. That's really, I can imagine there's a lot going through your mind at the time. And I think that that was a time in your life where I'm sure there were some big lessons. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what were some of the initial big lessons you learned amongst you know, the beginning stages of your activism? My mom got me my first um like it was like a London fog like coat because we wanted to be like the journalists on TV. <laughs> and I was like, I'm gonna wear this, this like khaki trench coat. And I got my very first cell phone <laughs> and I had the camera and I was like, you know, showing up at people's doors, like thinking like we're so professional. <laughs> And the aunties and uncles would just open the door and say, Aja beta and the Raja. Like they just knew that they were, we were beta, like you come on, child, come inside. <laughs> like we were trying to be so much. And because I wanted to to maintain like I'm behind the camera capturing a thing. But what happened over and over again is like there's no such thing as separating the personal and the political, right? Like in every interview, the 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 families, the the, the auntie or uncle would begin to cry. Um, and it wasn't recounting the act of violence. It was what followed afterwards. It was like this lost sense of belonging. Like, who are we? H how are we seen in this country? Like, what is our future? Like, it was that, the, to see them stripped of dignity and the pain and the agony of that. And then I would cry with them, like, and I would hug them. And then like the camera would just fall away, right? The division. So, I, I, and then similarly, the other moment the camera fell away was like when we were on the road and, and people began to yell at us, go back to your country, go back to where you came from, like take off that term with my cousin. And it was like there was never any separation that we were part of the story that we were documenting and that my coming of age, like I really got to see and understand how deep it goes, how deep white supremacist violence goes in this country and that and that what we saw after 9-11, what we're seeing now is, is not an aberration, but it's a continuation of the forces that helped found the country, founded on genocide, founded on slavery. And that the miracle is that black and brown and indigenous people with white allies and every generation before us have stood up to say, we're gonna, we're gonna make the constitution true. <laughs> we're gonna expand the meaning of we the people to include all of us. <laughs> we're gonna make <laughs> dignity, equality, justice, real in this country and not just words up here. And so I think that was the very beginning of me seeing the story of America as one long labor. Like America is a country still longing to be born and it's one long labor. So it's a series of expansions and contractions. 
But every turn through the cycle, if more and more of us stand up, show up to the labor in order to birth that America we dream, that we might get closer and closer to it. Now, here's the thing. I've been in this for 20 years. Like, I don't know how many more turns to the cycle it's going to take before we birth that society where we are safe and free. I, I can't believe my kids are growing up in a country more dangerous for them than it was for me or for my grandparents. And yet I found that the truest meaning of my life is to be able to, to show up when it's my turn with my full heart, with my wide imagination, with my love. And, 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 and that is what brought me to this place where like I have organized around hate for the last 20 years. My commitment is to spend the next 20 years of my life organizing around love because I believe that revolutionary love, that love that my grandfather taught me as a kid, that love is the call of our times. I love that. <laughs> yeah, and I think I think what's so beautiful about what you're doing is that it's giving people the framework to do so. You know, I think a lot of people wouldn't want to start from a place of love, but if the first instance is one where you know you feel that disappointment or that opponent or whatever it may be, you may not always have the right, um, yeah, the right direction or the right path to get there. And I also just wanna um, remind people, I see some questions going into the um, chat. So I don't wanna steal all of the time <laughs> for myself, even though I'm really curious. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and see if we can, um, call on a student, uh, Julia Carvalho, are you there? I'm not sure if you are, because this is so related to this. Could you ask your question, Julia? Oh, maybe they're not here. They are. Julia, can I turn on your camera so we can spotlight you, please? Julia? See Julia's camera, I think just unmuting. Oh, got you. Oh, hi, Julia. Yes. Hi. Go ahead and ask your question. So it's a simple question. I don't know. Uh, how to act with love in an ambient without love? It's hard for me. Actually, for me, it's very hard. How? Can you tell me why, what, what, what is the hardest about it? Yes. What is the hardest part about it for you? It's a hard question. <laughs> Actually, I <I'm> say sorry. sorry. <laughs> for me, I don't know, because when someone don't want to hear you, it's hard, you know, because how can I talk with someone if she, if this person doesn't want to, to, to get a straight, you know, it, I'm very excited right now. Sorry, but you know. <laughs> great job. No, it's the most, you, you, my love, are asking the most important question. Like, how do we love when it's hard? When it's hard to love. And what I have discovered is that love begins with wonder. Can you wonder about the person in front of you? Can you wonder, why do they think that? Why do they say that? Why do they believe that? Why do they do that? And if wondering about that person, if, if, if you feel a lot of activation in your body, if just thinking about their person, you feel like your heart's beating, your throat's closing, your, your palms are getting sweaty, then that is information for you. Your body is telling you, now is not the right time to reach out to that opponent. Now is the time to, to love on yourself to tend to the rage, tend to the grief, tend to the trauma in your body. The thing about revolutionary love is everyone has a different role at any given time. So I define revolutionary love as a choice to labor for others, for our opponents and for ourselves. And at any given time, there's one place where we need to be. Our wise woman will tell you. <laughs> but if you are someone, if you do see the person in front of you and you say, I can wonder about them. I feel a little uncomfortable, but I'm safe emotionally, physically, I can wonder about them, then, then you begin the process of, of listening. Here's the thing about listening. You listen to them not to change them or to compromise with them or legitimize them. You listen to understand them. And if you're motivated by wonder, then you really want to know, okay, why? Why? 
<laughs> and once you keep asking why, then first you're gonna hear the sound bites, the slogans, the you know, oh, the things that make you want to scream. But if you keep asking, pretty soon you'll you'll get down, down into their story. And once you hear their story, then you say, oh, that's why. That's why they cling to that narrative. That's why they go support these policies. That's why they act this way, they think this way. Once you hear their story, then you can see their wound. Here's what I've learned. There are no such thing as monsters in this world. There are only human beings who are wounded, who act out of their insecurity, greed, blindness, despair. That doesn't make them any less dangerous. But once we see their humanity, once we see their wound, they lose their power over us. <laughs> They're not one dimensional monsters like we are set free, right? No one can have power over us. We, we understand where they're coming from and why, and then we can we get smarter. This is not just a moral commandment that I'm inviting us to do. It is a strategic, pragmatic necessity. Because once we understand our opponents as human beings, frail human beings who are acting out of a wound, then we can say, mm, what cultural norms allow them to do this? What institutions, what policies, what speakers, what social media algorithms, like what, what is that? And then our, our, our role is to be part of movements and campaigns that change that, change the context. It could be that when you wonder about that person, human beings mirror each other, right? If we come out with daggers, they're gonna come out with daggers. <laughs> but if we come out with like true wonder, then they might start wondering about you too. They might want to hear your story. They might, deep listening is an act of surrender. You risk being changed by what you hear. They might be changed by hearing you. And when that happens, you've punctured the echo chamber that they've been in and you, they carry you in your heart now. And you may not see that change the next day or the next year or even in 10 years, but it might happen in this lifetime. And that is the kind of deep transformation that I'm after that I believe that we need sound policies, we need sound government, but the only way we're gonna birth that world to come is if we create a shift in culture and consciousness. If we invite people to into a way of being and seeing that leaves no one behind. If I can see you as my kin and say, I'm not gonna let you stay outside of, of my heart and my circle of care. I, I call that a love without limit, a, rev, a revolution of the heart, <laughs> revolutionary love. And I think that's the invisible revolution that I'm after. You know, revolutions don't just happen in the big public marches, or those are really important moments, but true lasting revolution happens in the spaces where people are coming together to inhabit a new way of being. So what if, what if we could see these, these communities of care, these communities where the love ethic is being practiced? What if every school, every home, every organization could be a container for beloved community. I feel like if we if we live into it, where we are in our inside of our own bodies, in our relationships, and then our you know in, in our larger communities, we can start to amass the collective wisdom to do it for our nation and, and for our world. That's the transition I think we're in as a, as a human species. That a human being has to become a human who knows how to love well if we are to survive. It begins with us. <laughs> thank, you, Julia. thank you so much for your question <laughs> i i really appreciate that um perspective as well and i think that when i when i first started looking into you know the the structure that you're building around revolutionary love i really loved when you talked about um listening uh, to our opponents as being critical because it kind of reminds me of what we talked about here so this listening you know this concept of curiosity before judgment like how do you ask a question before thinking you know what's going on and i think that one i think it reminds me of a time where um listening sorry there's a, a grumbling noise around me i hope it's not bothering you i don't know where it's coming from um but it reminds me of a time i was watching this documentary which is why i think filmmaking is really powerful um this documentary by this comedian who's half black half white and he kind of goes into the middle of nowhere in the US and speaks directly to white supremacists and is asking them, you know, like, why, why do you believe these things? Like, what, what is it, you know? And in my mind, I'm like, of course, it's because they hate people. <laughs> and as they're talking, I'm listening and they're saying, actually, no, you know, we're scared that like our race is being wiped out or whatever kind of 
um, my thought process was going through their mind and I never had access to that thought process before. And so I think it's so interesting to think about listening as like part of the revolution, you know? And I'd love for you, if you could maybe give an example of a time where you, you listened to the opponent and it gave you exactly what you needed to kind of like win, win the battle in the long run or, or strategize or something. I'm not sure if you yeah. know that. Oh, well, Bill Beer Uncle's mm. murderer. I mean, for 15 years after Bill Beer Uncle was killed, I, I only saw the killer as a monster. I couldn't wonder about him. And that was okay because my role was to be able to love on myself, my family, my community, to tend to my grief, to tend to my rage. And then it, once I, I, I was further in the healing process, it was the 15 year anniversary after his death and we were at the gas station where he was killed and we were putting the flowers down and the candles and I was standing next to his brother Rana and Rana says you know nothing has changed and I said who who is the one person we have not yet tried to love so the next morning we called Frank Roque in prison and we hadn't heard him since the trial I mean the last words we heard were like yes yes I said that I said we should go kill those towel heads and their children too I mean it was so so I didn't know if I was making a mistake, but the phone was ringing and, and he answered and we asked him why he agreed to speak with us. And he said, well, I'm sorry for what happened to your uncle, but I'm also sorry for the thousands who were killed on 9-11. I mean, he was not taking responsibility and I felt enraged, enraged. And, and rage is a, the force that protects that which we love, right? Rage is a part of revolutionary love. And so I was honoring my rage and realizing I was trying to protect Rana and perhaps because I was trying to protect him, I was giving him space to keep listening to Frank. And Rana heard what I could not hear. Rana said, Frank, this is the first time I've heard you say you were sorry. And Frank says, yeah, yes, I am sorry for what I did to your brother. And when I go to heaven to be judged by God, I will ask to see your brother and I will hug him and I will ask for his forgiveness. And Rana, she said, we've already forgiven you. Forgiveness is not forgetting. <laughs> forgiveness is freedom from hate. It's for you. It's for you. It's not for them. And sometimes forgiveness comes at the very end of a healing journey. And like it did for me. And other times it comes at the very beginning. Like the families who lost loved ones in Charleston, they looked in the eyes of Dylan Roof and said, I forgive you. I mean, I, I was upset. And then I realized that for them, it, they were saying, you cannot make me hate you. You cannot take that from me. Like I am more powerful. Like, so forgiveness was the beginning of their healing journey. So for some of it, us, it comes at the end. Some of us, it comes at the beginning. For others, it comes in the messy middle. Some of us survivors withhold our forgiveness because it's the only act of agency. Maybe it'll never come. And that's okay. Because forgiveness is for you, not for them. But once that happens, once you, once you can release that animosity, it opens up the previously unimaginable possibility of reconciliation. And that requires that other person. Like our forgiveness wasn't contingent on his apology and his apology wasn't contingent on, his, on our forgiveness. But somehow there was someone in the prison who loved him well enough to get to that place where we could meet. And then magic happened. And, and listening to Frank, I've met with him several times now and I listen to him, even it's still hard, <laughs> it's still hard. And I have to like, it's wonder, like I just have to keep wondering, right? And then empathy will come and compassion will come. Empathy is to feel as another, compassion is to feel for another. But when I can't even do those things, just wondering returns me to the labor of love, right? So I keep wondering about him. And the more I hear his story, the more I understand that so much of white nationalist aggression in the United States is a symptom of unresolved grief. They are grieving the notion that this country ever belonged to them in the first place. I don't agree with the grief, right? <laughs> I don't think they should be, you know, but, but it's real for them. The emotion is real. And someone has to tend to that grief. You know, it might not be me, but it might be it might be you or you or you, right? Like somebody has to tend to that grief. So to, to, to invite white folks especially to sit with their colleagues and their relatives and their students and their neighbors and engage in that process of listening. I mean, just like I have to tend to um, the, the racism inside of my own community, like we all have a role to play, 
with people to hear, to, to tend the wound is, is to be able to love them into a possibility of transformation. And if it could happen for Frank Roque after 15 years, then it makes me believe I hold on to the audacity <laughs> that it could happen for all of us. Oh my gosh, that is, that's such a, an amazing way to put it um, that I, I never heard before. Just this idea that, you know, like they're, they're also processing grief and, and to see the humanity in, you know, someone who could do kind of the, the more disturbing things and still, and still be like, okay, I, I know that you're still human. You know, I think that's really powerful. And that's kind of why I'm so intrigued by this idea of revolutionary love as something to, you know, put into our movements as well. Mm, but, but remember, it took me 15 years <laughs> to get there. And so this is what I always say, because I'm, I'm, if you have a knee on your neck, mm -hmm. it is not your role necessarily to look up at that opponent and try to wonder about them <laughs> or listen to them, right? Your role is to stay alive, my love. To, that's your revolutionary act to put breath in your body. But if you are someone who is safe enough or brave enough mm -hmm. to listen to those kinds of opponents, then we need you. We need you now because the only way we will we will birth that new society is if we hold up a vision of of, of a future that that leaves no one behind, yeah, and not even them. Yeah, and I, yeah, thank you for for <laughs> reminding us of that. You know that it's also about patience and time. And I think sometimes you forget that the timeline of justice is very different to maybe our own lifespans or what's yes. possible in the moment as well. Yes. Well, I would love to call on another student. I see this um, beautiful question, or student, or maybe um, just another audience member. Leticia, Piera, are you there? Could you turn on your camera and ask your question about any cause? Oh, there you go. And just say where you're, where you're calling in from as well. Hi, first of all, I just wanted to say that Valerie has touched my heart on the deepest part and I can feel all your love. I get so emotional. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll, I'll be emotional with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I just wanted to ask, how can I start helping other people and how did you find your cause? Yeah. Oh, you know, I... I really relate to this question because in my early 20s, especially, every time I had a big decision to make, like, where do I start? What issue? What do I major in? What do, what do I do after I graduate? I would go to everybody else <laughs> and ask them, tell me, just tell me what to do. <laughs> like I would go to the, like relatives, I would, I, would, I would go to professors, I would go to advisors. And it took me a long time to understand that the best that they were doing is they were showing me how they found their calling. And it was really useful information. They had the codes to their life, but no one has the codes to your life, except you, <laughs> you. And that's where that wise woman practice really set me free because she doesn't have all the answers, but she begins by, by helping me see like, oh, my love, like, you're really staying up late because the super fires in California, the sequoias burning, they're, they're making you like, you're feeling grief in your body. It's breaking your heart. Okay, that's information. That's information that there's, this is, this is the time to bring climate justice in the front and center of your work now. So every story I begin when I'm, when I'm speaking on the lecture circuit begins with the sequoias because she begins with like here, right? So there are many, many issues. They're all connected. And so to be able to get clear on what you what grief you're carrying in your body and then what skills that you have, like not just what skills you think you're good at, but when you do that thing, you feel most alive. So I feel most alive when I'm speaking, <laughs> when I'm writing, right? And so I'm I'm not I'm not great at the artist brush. I'm not great on the Twitter feed. Like I'm not great at all these other things I wish I was. Like even traditional lawyering, I'm a trained civil rights lawyer and I've done like I've written complaints for lawsuits, but I don't feel alive in that. Like I'm okay at it, <laughs> but I don't feel alive at it. And so I've finally learned not to do what I think I should I'm supposed to be doing, but instead like do the thing that makes you feel fully alive. So follow what breaks your heart, 
think about when you're doing a thing, what, what makes you feel fully alive and then take that bold step, just the one step. When I first started to travel after 9-11 with my camera, I had no intention of making a film. I just thought I was collecting stories. Like you take one step and then the next appears and then the next and the next and the next. And it's almost like breadcrumbs. And pretty soon, I mean, when I was in the midst of my journey, it made absolutely no sense for me to study religion and then go to divinity school and then go to law school. It made no sense. Like I couldn't even explain it to other people. I just knew that like my body needs to be there. My mind needs to learn this thing. My heart needs to go there. And now, I mean, or, like I left a good job at Stanford Law around net neutrality and digital freedoms because I felt like there's something deeper that was needed, deeper medicine around revolutionary love. And the little critic was like, you can't use the word love. Like you're a lawyer. No one's going to take you seriously ever again. <laughs> right? But I could feel what was breaking my heart. I could feel what was making me alive. And I just had to take that one step. And now five years later, there's a whole movement underway around revolutionary love all across the United States and some, and in some pockets of the world too. So I feel like when you're in it, it's not going to make sense. But if you think of your life as a series of callings and you just leap and then you leap and you leap and then 20 years later, you'll be in a room, you'll come back in as alum <laughs> to this <laughs> global citizenship gathering and you'll tell your story and you'll look back and it'll make so much sense. It'll be a coherent story <laughs> that only comes at the end. <laughs> so I hope that's that's helpful to you, my love. Yeah, that was helpful. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh. I definitely feel what Leticia is saying about like wanting to kind of just like tear up a little bit when you're speaking about <laughs> when you're speaking about something. So I was like, don't do it, girl. Don't do it. <laughs> no, we could do it. Our whole selves are invited in this sacred space, right? <laughs> exactly. I'm a liar, so I definitely know that's like, oh, and so um, we only have nine minutes left, and I have so many things I want to ask and so many questions that I'm seeing coming in from um people in this chat so i think what i'd love to do is maybe get one more question in here from from the slido um and this is actually from a mentor uh juliana and i would love if you could ask your question about love and compassion are you are you there juliana? i am here thank you so much um and thank you valerie for this beautiful session um my question for you is uh i'm trying to find it on the slido can you speak to the links between radical love and compassion for self and others? Um, and I emphasize the self and others because I'm also asking why is it so difficult specifically for change makers to turn that love and compassion inward? Because it's something that I've been um, personally struggling with. Oh, it's about. so hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard. It was honestly, it was, I, I had a moment of breakdown. It was the last presidential election, 2016. I came home from the airports the day of the Muslim ban. I had my small son and I was just, my, my tears were streaming down my face. And I just, I had spent year after year, after year, after year, after 9-11, just pushing, 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 grinding my bones to the ground, thinking that I was only as worthy or as important <laughs> as my ability to suffer. Like I, I would make myself suffer in order to serve. Like I didn't only got three hours of sleep. I didn't even eat today. Like I sat with so many people who took their trauma and I cried with them and I didn't do anything for my, like it was, it was just, it was just an onslaught. And I had, I had very few voices around me who were helping me see that, that I was worthy of love too. Um, and this was before I found Wise Woman, right? <laughs> and it was it was the moment where I, I heard myself say, like, I can't live in this world. I'm not strong enough. And then I heard it again and again. And then I started to get scared. And then my my husband was like, thank God, he caught me. And he's like, we, we have to do something. We will do something. There's no such thing as self-care, right? Community care. <laughs> so I had a small advance to write this book. And we took that as our, as our, lifeline. And for the first time in my adult life, I took a step back from the front lines and my family left for um, the rainforest in Costa Rica, where we lived for a year. And we we're at the top of this mountain. My husband like, and my father like pulled the writing desk up the mountain. My mother unpacked all my books and all my journals I'd kept since the age of seven. And I began to read my life like it was a text from a little girl on. And 
the, the rainforest was warm and wet and generative and safe. It felt like the womb. Like I felt like I was in the womb of the earth. And honestly, Juliana, it was the first time I felt like I took a really deep breath and I allowed myself to take that breath. And it was in the rainforest that I got to like, let the trauma surface and feel it and honor it. And then ask what information it was carrying and, and began to understand like that love, that revolutionary love was an ancestral practice. Like how did our ancestors like survive and thrive? And I began to do research and then I began to like chart out like if revolutionary love is the call of our times, then how, how do we practice it? So I began to demystify it by saying, okay, these are, these are the core practices. And that's how I began to write my books, you know, Stranger. And now I've come back with this compass, which I'll hope will show you before we close this practical tool so that we could bring love in our lives. But I created it to save my own life, to save my own life. And now I'm back in the country and I carry the rainforest inside of me. I carry the rainforest inside of me. So when we all took that breath at the beginning of the hour, it was part of how I have learned to weave breath throughout my labors, to love myself enough to be able to do that. When we do that, when we, when we weave breath throughout our labors, then we create space to let joy in. I used to feel so guilty about joy, but now I understand that joy Joy returns us to everything that is good and beautiful and worth fighting for. Every night, my children and I dance. The darkest nights, pandemic, climate crisis, war, like most awful things that I show up to in the day. But at night, we dance. And sometimes I'm like, I can't talk about Bruno one more time. <laughs> but then, all right, we'll get in, we're going to get into it. We don't talk about And the kids are laughing and I'm laughing and we're we're celebrating joy in the Sikh faith is called Chardikala, ever rising spirits, even in darkness, ever rising joy, even in the thick of the labor. And I have finally come to understand that laboring for a more just and beautiful world with love, with joy can be the meaning of life. Thank you so much. That was incredibly beautiful. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Honestly, that, that is what I most wish for all of you as young change makers, as leaders um, in this world. When you're young, starting out, everyone's like, go save the world, go change the world. And like, without like, no, you're, you're going to change it with me. It's not all on me. We're all, we all have a role. And like, I want you to last. I want you to last, not just the next couple of years, but decades. How are you going to last decades? Like, I want to grow old and I want to grow old with you. Too many activists, too many change makers have, their lives have been taken, they've taken their lives, they've gotten sick, they've opted out, not us. We're gonna do it differently because we're making love our compass. Love for others and love for ourselves, love for each other. So my greatest wish for you all coming out of this cohort is like find the one or two people in this space who are like, they, they know me, they got me. When I have that all is lost moment, I can, I can chat with them, I can call them, they can say, breathe my love, we're gonna breathe. Remember we're connected under the roots, all right. <laughs> take a breath and you are brave enough. Let's go, let's do the next thing together. We'll catch each other. And if we keep doing that for each other, we're, we're not just surviving. We're like presaging the world to come. We're modeling what it looks like to live inside of that kind of love. That's my wish for you. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed because there's so many things that I like to ask that students would like to ask and I'm so grateful that people have submitted questions and I really wish we would have had time for all of this. Um, I, I know we only have two minutes left. Would you still like to introduce the compass though? Because I'd, I'd love for people to know more. Yeah, yeah. So um, you can go in and share it. So we're building a movement around revolutionary love. Here's the compass we've been putting into people's hands. People are self-organizing around this compass in, in schools and in houses of worship, organizations, advocacy organizations are like, how do we not become what we're fighting against? So they're taking this compass and it's, it's, it's love, defining love as sweet labor, fierce, bloody, a demanding, imperfect, life-giving, revolutionary love, the choice to enter into labor for others, our opponents, and ourselves. For others, that practice is called see no stranger, it's wandering and grieving and fighting for people. For opponents, that practice is called tend the wound. It begins with tending our own wound, our rage, honoring our rage, 
then listening when it's safe, reimagining solutions together, and then how to love ourselves. I take the wisdom of the midwife. She says, breathe, my love, and then push. And then you're transitioning yourself as you're transitioning the world. And that joy, that radiant sun in the corner is like what, what it feels like when we're inside of this. So if you go to um, seenostranger.com and you click on Learning Hub, you'll see all of these free tools. It's like guided meditations and inquiries and practices and curricula. And now like people are making artwork into it. People are making music into it. Ani DeFranco had her whole album called Revolutionary Love. Shepard Ferry has been putting his, uh, illustrating each of these practices. It's like, so take it and run with it, make it your own. It's open source, it's yours. Um, and, and to the extent that any of this is speaking to you, we're just, I'm saying, you know, it's so new. This is your birthright. <laughs> this is wisdom already inside of you. Love is your birthright. So um, this is just surfacing what's what's within. And so if you if you want to stay connected, I put my um, Instagram there um, at Valerie Kaur. And so if there are questions you haven't asked yet, feel free to DM me. Um, I don't say this to everybody, but I want to say it to all of you because I think you're exceptional and extraordinary. I want you never to feel alone. We're part of a movement together and we're going to change this world together, even as we love ourselves well in the process. Thank you so much. Wow, well, oh, I couldn't think of a, just a better way for this conversation to go. I'm so grateful for everybody who could join us. I'm grateful to you, Valerie, as you see in the chat. Um, there's a way to send gratitude to Valerie through that link. So please feel free to fill out that survey and just say how much you've loved Valerie as much as I have. And please also, you know, check out her resources, as you mentioned, her Instagram, everything. Um, we usually like to close with a rapid fire question of a piece of advice you'd give yourself when you were 18. So if you can give us um, that. <laughs> oh, my love. I, I want to say don't worry so much, but I know that I wouldn't be like, uh-huh, <laughs> like, I wouldn't actually do it. It's like, what do you mean don't worry so much? Like I have to build a whole life and, and there's no path for what I want to do. Like how do I, so what would I actually, what would be useful? It's like, oh, my love, sink into the pleasure of being alive. Oh, chills. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Every morning I wake up now and I wish I started when I was 18. I say, I get to be alive. I get to be alive today. I get to be alive today with you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now that I'm crying. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bali. I really appreciate this. I really appreciate all of you all for showing up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sahar. We'll end with one deep breath. Are you ready? Let yes. it come and let it go. And if you have that ancestor in your back, know that you can always, always call upon them. And just remember one day you will be an ancestor. Someone's going to gather in space and they will summon you. They will think about you. <laughs> and if you show up with all your heart, with all your love, what they will inherit from this time will not be our fear. It will be our bravery. It will be our joy. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. <laughs>